My heart is to see God's people full of passion and the fire of God, hungry for His presence on a daily basis, full of His power and having a positive impact on the world and those around them, living a life of freedom and victory. This is Running With Fire. I once heard someone make this comment, what do you want people to say about you at your funeral? A pretty searching kind of question, isn't it? Not one we really want to think about a lot. I think the point being made was, once you've decided what you want people to say, then make sure you start living out your life accordingly, so when the time comes, they will be able to say about you the things that you want said. The reality is this, all of us are gonna leave behind a legacy, an influence on other people, a good influence or a bad influence. The reality is we all influence tens of thousands of people, you know, from not just our generation now, but generations to come. And so the way we live is critically important. And I want to look today at what is the best influence or legacy you could ever leave. Stay tuned. About 14 years ago, my mum passed away and my dad had died 20 years earlier. Thankfully, both were wonderfully saved, which is just such a delight to my heart. But because my parents had worked very hard and saved wisely, they were able to pass on an inheritance, a financial inheritance, to the kids, the boys, and to the two girls, which was a real blessing to us. So the way that they lived their lives impacted the next generation. Of course, even generations after that, I'll be able to be more generous as well. We will all leave a legacy that will affect future generations. And I believe this is one of the most important principles found in God's Word and that we need to understand. Because the truth is this, each of us will influence literally hundreds, if not thousands of people. Tell the person next to you, thousands. Yeah. Did you know you had that much influence? This will be family, this will be friends, it will be kids, it will be neighbors, it will be those you work with, it will be other Christians here in the church here or out, other churches, it will be people in other cities, and, and the impact, your impact will just be incredible. Not only today will you impact them, or next week or next year or in a decade to come, but in decades from now, in fact, in centuries from now, should the Lord tarry, the way you live today is going to affect future generations, hundreds, thousands of people. That is the impact of your life and mine. Come with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 17 and verse 3. Because we can leave a legacy in different areas. To leave a financial legacy, great, do it, but not at the expense of a spiritual legacy. Leave a good family legacy. You're a good family man or, or woman or husband or wife or father, great, but not at the expense of a spiritual legacy as well. 2 Chronicles 17, this is amazing. Now the Lord was with Jehoshaphat, that's good, isn't it? Why? Because he walked in the former ways of his father, David. So he walked in God's ways, or in the ways of his father, which were good ways, and he did not seek the Baals, which was idol worship. The influence of a father on a son. But he sought the God of his father, and walked in his commandments, and did not according to the acts of Israel. Therefore, the Lord established the kingdom in his head. Can you see this? Joshua, because of the legacy his father David left him, one, he's a follower of God. Secondly, he doesn't worship idols and go into sin and all that kind of stuff. Thirdly, he is successful. God establishes the kingdom in his head, all because of the legacy his father left behind. Most of us underestimate the influence and the impact of our lives. We really do. Most of us think, oh, well, I'm just Joe Nobody, and I've got a few friends and a little family, and hey, how, how I live and what I really doesn't matter that much. Hey, hold on. <laughs> you got that wrong. There's a quote. No man is an island. If you do good, you're going to affect a lot of people around you. If you do bad and sin, you're going to affect a lot of people around you. You can't do good or sin alone. There are repercussions that go out beyond your own life. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. In other words, we have bad character, it's going to corrupt other people around us. No man sins or does good on their own. Success 
You see, for me, it's not just what I do. I may build a church, God may bless, but what legacy will I leave to coming generations? Will they be passionate followers of Jesus, lovers of God, ones who serve him with all their hearts? See, we have the ability to pass on righteousness or unrighteousness, blessing or cursing, love for God or a lack of love for God. We can pass that on to those around us. And in fact, we do pass it on. It's scary. Listen to this quote. Christianity is never than more, more than, Christianity is never more than one generation from extinction. How does that happen when we don't pass our faith on to the next generation? They're going to start to lose it. Come with me to Judges chapter 2 and verse 10 for a really interesting verse of Scripture. Judges, not, it's not a nice Scripture at all, but it's interesting. It says, when, when all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them. Guess what? It's the next generation. Who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. Isn't it amazing? There's one generation of God lovers. The very next generation, after that generation, all gone, the next generation following, they're not God lovers. Tragic. You know, Christianity in many nations, especially in the West, has been in decline through the generations. I found some statistics coming out of the United States about believers. They're not the latest statistics. They're a few years old, but you'll get the point. Watch carefully. Listen carefully. The builders who were born 1927 to 1945, 65% are Christians. It's cool, isn't it? The next group, boomers, born 1946 to 64, 35% are Christians. So we dropped from 65 to 35%. The busters, born 65 to 76, 16% are Christians. The bridges, my generation, born 1977 to 1994, guess what? 4% Christians. It's gone from 65%, 35, 16, 4%. Now, the interesting thing is this, is many of the builders and boomers, those born 1927 to 64, have a vibrant faith. But friends, that's not enough to have a vibrant faith. You've got to take that vibrant faith and you've got to pass it to the next generation, which passes to the next generation, on it goes. Having a vibrant faith and love for God, friends, in itself is not enough. We've got to work out how we can intentionally pass on our faith, faith to other generations that are still to come. Because we've lost a lot of ground in this area, friends. And we've lost in one big area in which we've really lost ground is decades ago, the number of kids that would be taken to kids' church and Sunday school was huge percentage. And over the years, it's gone down and down and down and down. And friends, I want to encourage you, if you're a grandparent or you have children or your neighbors have children, get them to kids' church every week. Friends, not just once a month or once every two months or every third week. Get them there every week and do what you can to pass faith through to the next generation. It will make a massive difference. Friends, our statistics won't go from 65% down to 4%. You know, you may be thinking, what can I do to pass on my faith? I've just told you one very simple thing that you can do, and I encourage you to do it. Second point is this. <clears throat> Everything I do is a seed sown into the next generation. Man, this is frightening. <laughs> so if I sow godly seeds, love for God, church attendance, all the rest of it, it's a seed sown into my family, those around me, and coming generations. In contrast, if I sow dishonesty, pornography, it's a seed sown into the next generation and those around me. Have you ever noticed, if a group of people once starts to drink, be immoral, often that will be a seed to those around them and they'll start to drink, get drunk, and be immoral. Our influence, friends, you influence so many people. Why don't you tell the next person next to you, you influence so many people. Nice and loud. <laughs> Yell it at them if you like. Here's a quote. What walks in the Father runs in the Son. So what's, what character traits do you have in the Father if they're godly, loving, serving God? I hope that will run in the Son. They'll be even more lovers of God. But if there's anger and Immorality and all that in the father, it walks in the father. It's gonna dangerous, it's gonna run in the sun unless that father or mother reaches out to God, encounters God, and, and gets that area of their life sorted out. There was a study done of two households in the 1700s. 
The first household was Max Dukes and his wife. They were drunks, thieves, adulterers. They traced 1,026 of their descendants over the generations. They found that 300 died prematurely. 150 were criminals. 100 spent time in jail. 17 murderers, 60 prostitutes, 100 drunks. 300 died in absolute poverty. They sowed sins of, seeds of sin into the future generation and left a disastrous legacy. See, friends, they probably had no idea that what they were doing back then was going to have an impact 100 years later and beyond that. Seeds are a powerful thing. In contrast to that, they did a study of Jonathan Edwards and his wife. They loved God, honored him, and they taught the Bible to their kids and their family. They traced 1,029 descendants. This is what they found. 300 preachers, 65 college professors, 13 university presidents, 29, 295 college graduates, 16 wrote books, 30 judges, 3 U.S. congressmen, 8 public officers, 75 Navy officers, 60 doctors, 100 lawyers, and 1 United States vice president. Now, hey, look, chances are one of your sons is not going to be the U.S. vice president, and you may not have 60 doctors and 100 lawyers come, but can you see the point? The seeds that we sow, the life that we live, is going to affect people hundreds of years should the Lord tarry from today. You see, only eternity will re reveal the true impact of your life. That's why I think the judgment day is reserved to right to the very end. Right to the very, very end, because all the details and all the facts are not in until right till the end, until Jesus comes back and we all, we all end up in heaven. That's when God will decide what the fruit of your life was, the, fruit, the seeds that you sowed, what the real impact of it was. And some of you are going to be staggered at the incredible fruit, unbelievable fruit, that's going to be credited to your account, which you had no idea about. Our God is an awesome God. So I want to recommend to you to live totally 100% sold out on fire for God today, if for no other reason than for the sake of your family, your kids, the people around you, for future generations. See, I'm a grandparent now. I have two grandchildren, Zach and Emma. And let me tell you this, they motivate me to live for Jesus Christ with all my heart because I want them to be passionate lovers of God. I want them to serve God with all their heart. I want them to go further than I have ever possibly gone. And how can I do that? By sowing the right seeds into their lives today. Now. Point number three, the greatest legacy is a godly life. Yeah, there are lots of legacies we can leave, as we said, financial legacies and all that, but a godly life is the best legacy that we can possibly leave. Proverbs 20 verse 7 says, A righteous man walks in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. See, we walk in integrity, then our kids are going to be blessed. I read the story about this pastor. It's quite a challenging story, quite a moving challenge. And the pastor said this, I remember walking into my grandfather's house and seeing him sitting at the table with his Bible open. We're talking about decades later, the son remembering the grandfather. A Bible open, and a seed was sown into the grandfather's own son, and then to his grandson. The pastor goes on to say this, his faith was passed on to my parents, they passed, then they passed on their faith to us, and we hope to pass on the legacy to our children. You're talking here, friends, four generations. A seed of Bible reading, sown by a grandfather, seen by the son. Trace it, trace it, trace it. Who knows in 200 years from now, friends, God tarrying, the impact of that moment of that grandfather sowing the seed of reading his Bible. Friend, you can do that. I can do that. We can all do that. Let your children see you reading your Bible. Let your grandchildren see you praying. Let them see you worshiping God. Let them see you serving. See, when they come to church with you, friend, you've got your raised hands raised up. 
Honestly, you know, my, my grandson, Zach, and Emma, they, 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 they see it, friends. It's a seed sown into their lives that you better believe is going to bear fruit for the glory of God. I must say, though, right at this point, that some of you, as parents, you have lived for God, you've served Him, you've done it all right, but your kids are still astray. Don't let the devil condemn you. Because living right and doing it right is no guarantee. It's just, in the kingdom of God, one plus one doesn't always equal two. And sometimes some of your kids, they may be away from God. I just would encourage you, hold on to God. Keep praying. Keep believing. God is a God of miracles. But that last, worst of all, don't feel condemned. Don't let the devil condemn you. Just continue to do your part. That's all you can do is your part. You know, they've got their own will at the end of the day to make their choice. But you can do your part and sow the right seeds of godly and good living. Let's go to 2 Timothy 1 and verse 5. Are you okay out there? Don't go too quiet now, will you? When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, that's, that's Timothy, listen to this, which dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and I'm persuaded is in you also. Think about this. Think about it, friends. Grandmother, Lois, a lover of God, passes her faith to her mother, who passes on to Timothy. Timothy is called by God. He, 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 he pastors a church. He influences hundreds, probably thousands of people. We still read about Timothy uh, today and are inspired by him. We've got a, a letter written to him, friends. And that grandmother would never have had in the wildest imaginations that her sowing seeds of loving God would w go down through the generations to Timothy and then to you and I in 2014. The way she lived, and the fruit crediting to her account is going to be astronomical. God is an awesome God. A lot of credit for Timothy's life. Sure, he's a great man of God. But when God looks from heaven, I reckon he sees Eunice and Lois. He doesn't just see Timothy. He sees those who impacted his life. Because of Leonis and Lois had failed. Timothy may have not got anywhere near where he did in his lifetime. Jonathan Edwards was a great man of God. And his wife wrote something that just so stirred my heart. She wrote to her daughter Esther shortly after the death of her husband. And I just think that sometimes when a wife writes it, it just has that much more impact about her husband. Because there's no cover-up. Here we go. This is what she said. She said, after her husband died, she said, what shall I say? A holy and good God has covered us with a dark cloud. Husband had been lost. But my God lives, and he has my heart. Then she said this. Oh, what a legacy my husband and your father has left us. We are all given to God. Isn't that wonderful? The husband would, wife would say, he's gone now, but the legacy, the phenomenal legacy he left behind, I think we all want that set of us when we move on to the other side. Come with me to 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings 11. I hope you're getting inspired to sow the best possible seeds that you can and you're throwing away any condemnation the devil's trying to throw at you at the same time because it's always a battle, isn't it? 1 Kings 11, 11. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this and have not kept my covenant, my statutes which I've commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servants. So Solomon's in trouble. Verse 12, watch this. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father, David. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. I feel sorry for the grandson, really, or the son. But can you see the impact David's life spared pain and hardship for Solomon? Some of you, as you sit here today, I don't know how many, you've benefited by being raised in a Christian in a godly home. Some of you are third and fourth generation Christians. 
I want to say that you, in most cases, have had an incredible start to life. You've had seeds sown into your heart from your parents, seeds that people like me have to fight for with all of our strength because we've had a lot of bad seeds inputted into our lives. As you know, I was raised in a non-Christian home. I'm from a generation of generations of Hindu worshippers as far back as you can go. But I'm here to tell you this morning that God is greater than any legacy that you and I may have been left in our lifetime. My God has plucked me from the jaws of hell. He set my feet upon the rock. The cycle has been broken. And I have the greatest honor, the greatest privilege, and the greatest responsibility. I am called by God to start a new line, to start a new legacy of those who will love God, who will serve Him, who will run with fire, and will be passionate to work for Jesus all the days of their life. I've started a new line. I've started a new legacy, and I'm trusting God that generations to come will be lovers of Jesus. Friends, for me, that is a massive responsibility. I can't express to you the weight of that responsibility to love God and serve Him for the sake of my, my family, my children and grandchildren and generations that are yet to come. By the grace of God, I cannot and I must not damage the legacy that God has called me to leave. How often do you hear someone say, and they say, oh, my great-grandmother was a Christian. My uncle was a believer. My cousin followed Jesus. The impact of our lives and the seeds we sow, friends, on those around us is just amazing. Come with me to 2 Chronicles in chapter 6 and just watch what happens here, again, through the life of that great man of God, David. 2 Chronicles 6. Verse 42. O Lord God, do not turn away your face of your anointed. Remember the mercies of your servant David. When Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven, consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifice, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. David had been dead. Solomon's praying at the dedication of the temple. He prays, God, remember your servant David. The next thing, the glory of God fills the temple. That's legacy. That's leaving an influence for generations to come. My final point today is choose this day the legacy you will leave. You and I have been given the power, the authority, and the ability to decide what kind of legacy we want to leave, what seeds we're going to sow into coming generations. I encourage you to go away from this message. Take a few moments, and why don't you write down the legacy you want to leave? What do you want your grandchildren to be like? Do you really want them in church Sunday by Sunday? Loving God, serving God, lifting hands in worship? Do you really want them to live good, wholesome lives and have a positive contribution to society? Make your decision. And say, okay, that's what I want. These are the seeds I'm going to start sowing from today. From today. I close with two contrasting illustrations. A dog wandered into a preacher's home. And the three sons became very fond of this dog. It had three white hairs in its tail. The preacher saw an advert in the paper, a lost dog, three hairs in the tail. So in the presence of his three boys, the preacher removed the three white hairs from the tail. The owner traced the dog to this home and 
went in, the dog ran up to him, and the owner was ready to take him home. And the preacher said, hold on a minute. Didn't you say you'd identify the dog with three white hairs in the tail? They looked, they weren't there. The owner left without the dog. Sometime later, the preacher, with great sadness of heart, after some years had passed by, he said, that day, we kept the dog, but I lost my three sons for Jesus. They fell away from God. He'd sown a seed, which in this case had serious consequences. In contrast, let's go to the funeral of the United States President, Ronald Reagan. His son, at the funeral, said on a flight in 1988, his father told him about his love for God and his love for Christ, his Savior. The son Michael said, I didn't really know what it all meant back then, but I certainly know now. Michael Regan said, I can't think of a better gift a father can give a son. And I hope to honor my father. That's a good word, isn't it? Honor my father. By what? Giving my son Cameron and my daughter Ashley the very same gift he gave me. Some of us need to honor our fathers. The best way we can sometimes do it is loving God ourselves and then training our kids to be followers of Jesus. All of us can choose the legacy that we want to leave and the seeds that we are going to sow. We can't change the past seeds, but we can certainly change every seed from today onwards with God's help. This kind of message can change your life, the future of your kids, and your eternity. I recommend that let's all be like Joshua of old, who said in Joshua 24, 15, if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. It is so true and really challenges me that how we live, how I live, influences so many people. Not those just around me now like my children, but even generations to come. And we need to live our lives with others in mind. How will we impact others with the things that we choose to do today? With God's help, you and I can leave a fantastic godly legacy. We would love to hear from you. Why don't you contact us by the website on the screen Give us your feedback or your prayer requests. Join me again next week. Thanks for watching Running with Fire with Tark Barna from Church Unlimited. For more great free content, visit runningwithfire.com. You can send us your prayer requests, stream online TV and radio episodes, and view blog articles. You can also connect with Tark Barna through Twitter for regular updates. Church Unlimited meets at two locations in Auckland, New Zealand. You're welcome to come along for a visit.